Have you ever received a summons to appear in court? For most people, having to appear in court is a scary prospect, whether you're guilty or not. We're fortunate to live in a country under the rule of law. Governments come and go, presidents and prime ministers come and go, but our security is not wrapped up in leaders. It's an independent judicial system and we can be grateful for that. Spare a thought for those who live under a dictatorship or military regime, where justice is at the whim and disposition of the person in control. You could never feel safe. And unfortunately, there are still too many of those around. In the epic story, the accusation is made against God that he is not fair, that he's cruel, dictatorial, untruthful and restrictive of his creation. But being a God of love, he does not use force. He made us free moral agents and we can choose to acknowledge him or reject him. The good news is that he will not let the reign of terror with all its pain and suffering go on forever. It's going to stop. And it will stop in a most dramatic way. By then the destiny of every human being who has ever lived will have been determined for eternity. That determination is the process we call judgment. The Bible has a lot to say about judgment. In fact, God puts himself on trial. He opens up the book so all can see why he has done and what he has done. God is love. Therefore, he will do anything to save us. Join us as we investigate the good news of the judgment. Murray, the concept of judgment is a pretty scary idea. How do you um, teach people that the judgment is not scary? Well, I guess um, some of us have received speeding tickets and because we're feeling guilty, we, we feel condemned and we see God as this policeman trying to keep people out of heaven or, or maybe he's the accountant God with a scale and he's measuring good deeds and bad deeds and we're unsure whether there's more good deeds than bad deeds. And, and so with those pictures of God, judgment becomes very scary. So the first thing I think is to start off with a true picture of God. So God is not weighing our good deeds about, against our bad deeds. Well, the beautiful thing about being a Christian is that the cross tells us to trust in the lamb. Mm. And it's the lamb's good deeds that gets us to heaven, not ours. Ellen, I meet people, and I'm sure you've met them too, who or misquote a verse in the Gospel of John, I think it's the fifth chapter, where it says that we're not going to appear before the judgment. And so many Christians, I find, try to reason away the idea that the judgment is not for Christians. I think the verse you're thinking of there, Jeff, is in John 5, 24, um, the words of Jesus, and he says, Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment. Now, oh, there it is. That's, that's, that's the, the verse. text. Yes. Uh, those who believe in Jesus shall not come into judgment. Now, I think we've got to ask the question, is that saying, in effect, that the Christian will never come into judgment, be judged, be condemned in the judgment, or is it saying he will never appear before the judgment seat of Christ? If it means the latter, then we have to deal with Paul's statement in 2 Corinthians 5 verse mm -hmm. 10, which says, for we must all. He doesn't say you must or the Gentiles must, must, but we, right into the Corinthian church, he says we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. So I don't believe that Paul ever contradicts the words of Jesus. Mm -hmm. uh, that text, I believe, is, is really saying to us that we shall not come into condemnation mm -hmm. because we have that wonderful text in Romans 8 verse 1 that says, therefore there shall be no condemnation mm -hmm. to those who are in Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. And so that's one reason why I believe that judgment is good news because I don't have to feel if I'm in Jesus, if my trust is in him, then I don't have to fear the judgment because I will not come into condemnation because of the cross and because of what Jesus has done for me. Christiana, can you tell me why you think that the judgment is good news? 
Well, the judgment is good news because we have Jesus to be our advocate. Um, 1 John uh, 2.1 uh, is, is one of the great texts that we have is because not only that Jesus is actually going to be our judge, but he's also a lawyer. So it's like a win-win situation, really, uh, where in 1 John 2.1 it says that... Uh, uh, my little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate mm -hmm. with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. So we've got Jesus as our lawyer and we've got Jesus as our judge as well. Yeah. And that's why judgment is actually good news because he's always on our side. Well, I guess that if you employed a solicitor and you knew that he was going to be the judge as well yeah. and, he, and you'd already employed him, Yes. then you'd be pretty confident when you yes. went to, to yes. court, isn't that right? Yeah, that's and that's what you're saying that the Bible teaches. Mm. Yeah. And, and Jeff, if you can imagine what it would be like to be charged illegally mm -hmm. when you're innocent yes. and, and condemned to a, a dictator's prison without any chance of a trial or a fair go or, or a lawyer mm. and you just rotted decade after decade, as, as many people have done, with mm. some of the atrocities that have been performed in this planet. No chance to have a hearing, no chance to be heard, no chance to, do, to have uh, vindication. And you were told at such and such a time, in a few days' time, you're going to get a hearing, you're going to get a chance to present your case. Mm. And if you were told at that time that your defence lawyer is also the judge, you'd be doing cartwheels in the jail, wouldn't you? Mm. Absolutely. Bring it on because yes. judgment is vindication. The Jewish people sought judgment because they saw it as reward. They saw it as an opportunity to clear the name. So how long, O oh Lord, before you will avenge? How long, O oh Lord, before you will judge? How long, O oh Lord, before you will do something? This is the cry of the Psalms mm. and it's the cry of the martyrs in Revelation 6. People think, I think, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Judge Judy, uh, the television mm -hmm. show. But I remember clearly when I first watched it, you know, she was, there was these people lining up and they were waiting to, for their case to be heard. And Judge Judy is just there and she'd be staring, her eyes would be like popping out and her eyebrows are like crowning and just, uh, it would be like, oh, you know, what are you going to say to me? And she'll be like pointing her fingers. And I think people are thinking that God is like that. Yes. If Judge Judy is like that, then God surely will be like even worse. Uh, so I think it's, yeah, yeah. If but we, the Bible doesn't even say that. No. And, and the picture of the lamb there interceding yeah. for us as priest and high priest, the picture that God so loved the world that he gave us Jesus. The Father's love is there wanting to fill heaven, mm. not to keep people out of heaven. Mm. That the people that are not going to enjoy heaven, who choose to turn their back on sin, well, God's not going to make them suffer by giving them eternity and giving them heaven. Mm. You know, God wants people to be happy for eternity. Sure. And these people who've said no to Jesus and no to love and no to peace and they cause strife and they're greed, and they've, mm. you know, they're full of sin because they just love themselves, they're not going to enjoy a world that is all about giving and sharing and, and God. Mm. And I think this idea of, of uh, the, the judgment being good news yes. is borne out in this first angel's message. I mean, the, the three angels' messages are God's last appeal before Jesus comes. Mm. And to me, it's very important that the, the first angel's message is described in these words in Revelation 14, verse 6. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting mm. gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth. And then in verse 7, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come. Mm. In other words, here is a message to go to all the world just before Jesus comes, mm. announcing that the judgment hour, God's judgment hour, not is coming, but has come, but it's within the context of the everlasting gospel. Mm. And the everlasting gospel is the good news that God loves the world, that he's made provision on the cross so that every human being can have their sins forgiven. Mm. And that's the gospel. And if, if I come up to the judgment and all my sins are washed clean, the blood of Jesus cleanses me from all sin, then I don't have anything to fear in the judgment. Mm. It is really good news. Alan, I've often thought, you know, if, um, if I have to face the judge mm. and the judge has already told me that I'm innocent, <laughs> 
Well, bless your heart, to, 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 to stand up in court is... That's easy, isn't it? Because... And that's, isn't that the assurance that we have? Because we take into the judgment... The, 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 the statement that our sins are forgiven if we've confessed them to Christ. That's why it seems that, as you were saying, Murray, the judgment is such good news. Jeff, we, we, we worry about what God thinks about us. But the issue in the judgment is what does God think about Jesus? That's true. Mm. And if Jesus is my substitute, mm. why am I looking in at my sin? I should be looking out at the lamb. Mm. It's what God thinks of Jesus that's important. And as long as I'm attached to Jesus, mm. that's right. everything's right. Mm. And I, mean, I think that we've got to realise that with the gospel, it's not only that my sins are forgiven, but that I'm clothed, as the Bible uses that imagery, with the righteousness of Christ. In other words, Jesus treats me as his own son mm. because when I confess my sins, he gives me his righteousness. And if I'm clothed in Christ's righteousness, then what do I have to fear? Mm. What do I have to fear? Because I'm, I'm, I'm covered by him. Absolutely. Mm. Christiana, can you tell me when does the judgment take place in the, in the scheme of things? Mm, yeah. If we go to Revelation 22, 12, um, it actually says that before, uh, in verse 12, he says, Behold, I'm coming quickly and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. So before he comes, there is already some decision that will be made uh, to actually present, uh, you know, who will actually be saved and who will not be saved. Uh, he is bringing the reward just before, um, just yeah, at so his So you're coming. saying that the judgment takes place before Jesus comes back? Before Jesus comes back. This is a good thing. Yes. Because as Jesus is interceding, there is judgment. He's not coming as king making a decision or no one would be saved. Mm. He's doing it while he's interceding as priest. And the wonderful news is that this reward of the resurrection comes to be given to those whom God has sealed and judged. Mm. Wonderful news. Mm. Mm. And, I, and I think one of the clearest pictures of the judgment is, is found in Daniel chapter 7. Mm -hmm. Because in Daniel chapter 7, we have this vision given to Daniel of the four great beasts representing Babylon, Persia, Greece and Rome. And then at, toward the uh, middle of the, of the vision, John says that he sees a judgment scene happening in heaven. Mm. Because in Daniel chapter 7 and verse 9, it describes the Ancient of Days being seated. And then in verse 10, a fiery stream issued and came from before him. And at the end of verse 10, it says the judgment was set or the court was seated and the books were opened. And if we read on in Daniel chapter 7, it's very clear that this judgment described in Daniel 7 comes before the second coming of Christ. As you've said before, he comes and brings his reward, but that requires a judgment mm -hmm. prior to the second coming mm -hmm. to determine who's going to receive the reward and who's not. Mm -hmm. And I think in Daniel chapter 7, it's very clear that here is this biblical description of a judgment prior to the second coming, a judgment that decides those who are in Christ covered by his righteousness and those who are not covered by his righteousness and are out of Christ. I guess that makes sense too, Alan. When, when Jesus comes back, he divides the sheep from the goats, the wheat from the tares. Mm, yes. and, and if he's going to do that at the second coming, that means that prior to his coming, that determination must, be made. must have been mm. yes, made. Right. Exactly. And, and notice that passage there, Jeff, has one harvest. It's not like there are harvests every time someone dies. Mm -hmm. It's not like there are multiple harvests that somehow these goats are, are geeps or shoats. They're half sheep and half goat and, you know, they're going to change sides after the second coming. It's just one division, just one harvest. Yes. And God knows the sheep because they hear his voice and he knows those who have rejected his love. If God knows everything, why would he need books? Well, certainly the Bible teaches about books because in the text I've just read, it says the court was seated and the books were opened. Yes. And these books are being opened in the presence of the Father, uh, described here as the Ancient of Days. But I think it's significant, Jeff, that the same verse in verse 10 describes that it's not only God seated there on his throne in judgment, but it goes on to talk about the, a thousand thousands, that's a uh, hundred million, ministered to him, 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him, the court was seated. In, in other words, this judgment is taking place before angels. And angels are not omniscient like God is omniscient. 
Uh, they need to know that God is just. In the book of Revelation, there's a description where all the intelligent beings in heaven say, just and true are thy judgments. And uh, for them to be convinced that God's judgments are just and right, they need to have this, these books of record that the Bible speaks about opened up. But the good news is, I believe, that once my name is, is brought forth, since we all have to appear before the judgment seat of Christ, then once my name comes forth, Jesus is there and, and says, my, my righteousness covers him. Mm. But the, the angels need to know with all those who have ever lived on the earth, who have put their trust in God at one point, they need to know, have they been faithful to the end? Have they continued to trust in Jesus? Mm. And uh, therefore, even though God is omniscient, the angels are not. And neither are the other beings on other worlds because I believe the Bible does suggest that this planet Earth is a... Is a a, a little theatre, as it were, that the, where the drama of the ages, the great controversy is being played out, they need to see that God's judgments are just too. It's really open government, isn't it? It is. Uh, what transparency. Got, yes. You know, I, I teach my students that the business of the universe is the universe's business. Mm -hmm. And uh, where we, you know, we have Freedom of Information Act, but here's the God putting it all out yes, there. Yes, 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 yes. It seems to be a process, really, between uh, in the way that God uh, sets the judgment uh, for the people that there is the investigation that comes beforehand and you know that investigation would have to happen today now um, before Jesus mm. comes again for the second time and then there is the verdict uh, when he comes again for the second time as you said before sheep and goats and, uh, and then there is the execution in terms of you know okay so this is the decision and this is what will happen. Um, and to me that even though at the beginning that we're all going to be judged, but at, very, at the very end, God himself is kind of, we're all looking at, have you really been fair, mm. uh, you know, uh, in your decision making? Mm. Uh, uh, you know, how come such and such a person was here and, and such and such a person is not there? Uh, it seems that, yeah, God himself, he said, look, I'm, op I'm an open book. Uh, mm. Check me out. And we can't conceive of an earthly judgment without investigation. I mean, if, if we imagine that the law courts of the land made verdicts without looking at the evidence and yes. checking and investigating the, they had the a charge. Word for that, Alan. Kangaroo court. Well, that's, that's yeah. right, Jeff. Yes. Uh, and, and if that's true of human courts, how much more does God want Absolutely. to set the record very cleanly and openly before mm. all? It was good news when Paul said, God has appointed a day in That's which right. he will judge, yes. you know, and for Paul that was future. Yes. Yes. God has appointed. It's yes. good news. That's true. Mm. Yeah, because in this discussion that we're having with the great controversy, this is very, very central to it because if the devil, Lucifer, accused God of being unfair and unjust, mm. then the whole purpose of the judgment, it seems to me from what we're discussing with the purpose of the books mm. and being open judgment that God yeah. is actually on trial himself. That is, yeah. mm. his actions are on trial mm. and before the whole universe, everybody has an opportunity to see that God's actions mm. are fair. Mm. And therefore Satan the, is wrong. Yes. The original charges exactly. have been proved wrong. Can I read of that text? I just love yes. this one. Yes. Um, here in uh, Philippians uh, chapter 2 and verse 10, it says that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven, of those on the earth mm -hmm. and of those under the earth, which is code for the demons, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Mm. That's a wonderful outcome. So, Murray, that verse is saying that every person in the universe, mm. even the devil, yes, is going to one day confess that Jesus and God are just yes. and fair. Yes. Yes. Even those who've rejected his love. Yes. That's right. Everybody is going to confess that even though I'm going to be destroyed, God, you are just in what you're doing. You've given me what I've chosen. Yes. That's right. You know, God That's is right. not going to ride over people's choice. Those who choose death, he sadly has to give them yes. what they've chosen. And the purpose of those books, it seems, that God yeah. is going to be able to show me mm. why he's done what he's done. Mm. And that seems to me to be a tremendous God of love mm. to do that. Mm. To think that he would come down to the level and say, look, I'm going to show you why I've done what I've done. Mm. Uh, so judgment is really 
is it is good news, frees and destroys and gets rid of sin altogether because after all, who wants to be living with sin? Mm, and sure. who wants to be surrounded? I mean, we're all uh, pretty tired in hearing the news, uh, you know, night after night and hour after hour of mm. destruction here, destruction there, murders and killings and abuse and, and even just the earthquakes and uh, natural disasters coming one after another. Mm. And we just want to be free from all those things. Yes. And God says, enough is enough. There will be a time when I will come again and that investigation will be finished. Yeah. There's a limit to evil. Isn't that there wonderful is news? There is a limit, yes. yeah. God's drawn a line. And Mary, that's the point that you were making before when you said that the Hebrew concept of judgment is uh, bring it on, you know, bring it on quickly, quickly. Please. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, it seems that we are all influenced by the law courts in our country mm. on the Greek idea of the uh, adversarial uh, side of things. Mm. And unfortunately, we, when, when we take that to the Bible and we read judgment in the Bible, we're thinking of the adversarial side mm. instead of understanding mm. that judgment in as far as God is concerned mm. is making things right. You're already... Yes. Right, because I, you, I have forgiven your sins. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's natural for us to think of achievement. Yes. So we think that's my job rather than atonement, which is God's job. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. If I'm innocent, then I have no, nothing to fear in a, in a law court that's based on justice. Mm -hmm. And the good news about the judgment of God is that I am innocent regardless of what I've done because of the cross. Mm -hmm because of what Jesus did for me on the cross, then all my sins are forgiven and forgotten. And I think that's, that's to me, gives me such confidence. in the Assurance. Mm, assurance, mm. yes. And that, uh, that is supported by that text in, um, what was it, 1 John? Yes, 1 John. 1, 9. 2, 1, 9, if we... If we confess our sins. Faithful. He is faithful. He is faithful and just to forgive just. us our sins and to cleanse us from all of our unrighteousness. Yes. And it's only the next verse or two after that that says, if anyone sin, we have an advocate, yes. one who stands for us, one who is there uh, answering God on our behalf and assuring God that our sins are forgiven, that we are worthy of eternal life because of what Jesus has done. Yeah. Murray, why, why is it important, do you think, that God's character needs to be vindicated? Well, we wouldn't want to go through this sin experiment again, would we? You know, God has to secure the universe for all time. He has to have every person have all doubt removed that, you know, every activity of God has always been love. And I think the judgment enables all of us to get on board and see that this transparent God of love has always acted in our best interest. Mm -hmm. Very true. I just wonder about that verse. Is it in Nahum where... The prophet says that sin will never rise the second time. Mm -hmm. Because I'm sure all of us have had people say to us, how do you know the whole thing's not going to start all over again? Mm. You know. And what you're saying is that the vindication of God is going to put every person in the universe, all the angels, mm -hmm. never again will anyone question the fact that God uh, is love. And every, every atom reverberating with that message that God is love. Not just does loving things here no. and occasionally, no. but God is by nature love. Mm. Love personified. Mm. Mm. And when we come into that uh, relationship, when we accept Jesus, we, he, he, he writes in those, you know, we're talking about the books. Yeah. And what I love to think about is that opposite my name, when I've made a mistake, he writes there, forgiven. Yes. You know, forgiven. Mm. Yes. And, and so I can have confidence mm. to know that God has forgiven me. And that's why it seems that we should have confidence mm. when we go into the judgment and we ought to say, bring it on, yes. you know, bring it on, mm. because it will bring the end of, of, of sin. sin and, suffering, death. Mm. and so uh, as we have been uh, noticing again today, as we have studied this wonderful, wonderful subject in this great epic story. Remember, we're in a great controversy here. Satan has accused God of being unfair, making a law that's impossible to keep. And he's looking for mistakes. One of the great um, things that I used to believe when uh, before I really began to study the Bible, I pictured God 
as looking for mistakes in me to give me a wallop as soon as I made another mistake. How relieved I was when I began to study the Bible to find that God is the very opposite. He's looking for excuses to get us into heaven. And the judgment is good news. It says that wrong that's been on the throne for so long is finally going to be put on the scaffold and right is going to finally uh, triumph. And uh, as we mentioned in our discussion, that wonderful verse over here in 1 John, the second chapter and verse 1, let me just read it again because it's, it's a wonderful verse. It says, my little children. You see, God regards us as little children. And those of us who are around little children, we always make plenty of excuses for little children. And God regards us as little children. My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. But unfortunately, we do make mistakes. And that's why I love the rest of this verse. Listen, and if anyone sins, we have an advocate. That word means lawyer. You know what it's like when you get into difficulties and you go to the, the solicitors or the lawyers and you want them to plead your case in court. And here the Bible says we have an advocate. We have a lawyer, Jesus. And uh, he's with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And what a wonderful promise that is. And I would like to, uh, to appeal to every listener today to accept Jesus as your saviour. Then you have nothing to fear for the judgment. The judgment is good news because we have our sins forgiven. Mm -hmm. I'm going to invite you to bow your head with me as I pray to invite Jesus into your heart so that uh, you may be right with him and you may have the absolute assurance of sins forgiven. Shall we pray? Our Father in heaven, I just thank you again today for the wonderful assurance that we have been talking about, the assurance of sins forgiven, mm -hmm. that we have nothing to fear for the judgment, that you're on our side, you're looking for every excuse to get us into heaven. The only people that will be lost will be those who choose to be lost. And Lord, today, as best we know how, we want to accept you as our saviour. We want to put our decision on the side of Jesus. So bless every viewer, keep us faithful, keep us true to you. And as we continue to study, may your presence be with us, I pray for Jesus' sake, amen.